<laughs> Why do I play the banjo? I love the banjo, and I love that music. And that's about it. I, uh, I've always wanted to play. Since I was real little, since before I played. I just, uh, I loved the crispness and the attack and the bite of the banjo. I liked its growls and sounds, and I liked how it worked. I liked how it looked. I liked how you had to hold your hand to play it. I like how all, all those notes sort of tumbled out of it. Uh, and I still do. Oh, the banjo is, it's a great expressive sort of instrument. And to me, it's full of mystery. I like the fact that there's the things very unknown about, it, about its history. I mean, it frustrates me on one hand, and yet it delights me on another. someplace. A symphony is a journey. You know how they start and how it has a crescendo and it comes back with the repeat of the theme. So if a piece of music has that, trying to learn how to play the banjo would be like that. Although you might not know how it's going to end and it might not be organized like a work of art is, it's still a, a, a journey. It's a going someplace. Hundreds of years ago, I understand that the banjo came from Africa. Then it came in and got in the southern parts of the, of the United States, like Louisiana, and they were four-string banjos. Banjo, a concatenation of hoops and brackets and all of that. A man by the name of Joel Sweeney, I understand through the history that I read, is the man who made the, the fifth string on the banjo right here uh, what it is today. Now, they were all four strings then, and I forget, uh, over, well, way over 100 years, Joel Sweeney invented the uh, fifth string, on the, and they called it the five-string banjo then. It's a machine. Um, and it's wood, and it's metal, and it's skin, and it's string, and it's uh, ivory, and it's ebony, and it's uh, brass. But I always think of the banjo as more than that, of course, which is... Uh, and the various performances and the various persons who've played it. The first man I ever heard pick one was uh, Earl Scruggs uh, with the three-finger style that they're picking today and they call bluegrass. But there was other guys uh, who picked it that I understand through the history of the banjo, but Earl Scruggs popularized the five-string banjo by putting it in places it had never been. One of the interesting ways of thinking about banjos is in its literal sense, is relative to the different eras in the, in the development of the, the physical development of the instrument. Brought here uh, on slave ships, it was a gourd. And, uh, and, then, and then, as I understand, when cheese, cheese was sent in those round boxes, those round boxes became the hoops for a lot of banjos. That's what one scholar's written about, and I, I love that, you know, the, um, to make the rim. And as the music developed, this banjo was probably made for when the banjo was brought into the parlor and a more genteel music was played on it, sort of a classical kind of music and domestic music that was made. Uh, and then later on, the banjo gets a resonator added to it. And uh, as the music is changing, the instrument is changing. And in the southern mountains, there's those plain, beautiful wooden banjos, which are fun to play and have their own unique, wonderful qualities. And then there was the minstrel banjos, the big hoop, probably designed to, to fill a, a large theater with its sound. The 
Is a banjo a quintessentially American instrument? Well, it is in that many people have contributed to it. I suppose that's what we're talking about. Um, if America could mean an integrated society, it certainly would be quintessentially American because it's a black instrument and, and shared with white people. So that could be in the American dream of people being together. That would be quintessentially American, I guess. It's quintessentially American, I guess, if, if you consider loud and brash uh, American. And it's that. If being American is also sometimes lyrical and understated, the banjo can be that. If being American is being haunting and somewhat mysterious, the banjo can be that. If being American are the letters at the end of an address when you're away from home, well, I suppose banjos, five-string banjos in the United States do go together. It's certainly played for lots of lonesome traveling tunes, you know, and it accompanies a lot of those kinds of songs, the sorts of going down the road, feeling bad, that kind of traveling, that sense of motion. There's a lot of forward motion in playing a banjo. It's been, uh, well, through Carolinas and Kentucky and Tennessee, West Virginia mountains. The banjo has been an awful lot of places and a lot of homes. In fact, this one I'm playing right here, we'll talk about it if you like. Uh, I, I went to a fellow's house in Clinton, Maryland, who's a banjo maker, and Paul Tester, and had him to make this banjo for me the way I wanted it. I think that means a lot. I've had so many banjos in my life, and I like the sounds of them, but I didn't like the shape of the neck or so forth. And uh, I designed some of the pearl on the beginning of this banjo neck right here. This first design right here in the first fret loop, and the second one, uh, that belongs to me. I found that on a perfume box. This may be a copy of an old Weymouth banjo from here to here, but I like these two right here. As I said, I found them on a perfume bottle and asked a man, can you make that? It's sure. And the headstock here uh, with the Holy Cross on it with my name on it. I th thought of that idea one day and I thought, well, Here it is. I've thought about this place for a long time. They talk about this is the nation's attic, you know, the Smithsonian, right? Here it is. This is a whole, it's a whole room full of ghosts right now. Uh, this is Wade Ward's band show right here from Independence, Virginia. Right next to his house is a little place called Peach Bottom Creek. It's just a little, a little bit of water right next to his house, and he, wrote, and he had a tune called Peach Bottom Creek, and he played it on this band show. And look, the, the inlays here, this is what the inlays should look like, except he painted these on there. I guess the inlays had fallen out from use or, or whatever. He, he painted those on there. This is his band show. It's really more than the instruments. It's the practitioners. It's those people. That's what this is. This is part of a sort of a, a sign of his life. I, I, I just think that's extraordinary. Then here's another one. We don't know who played it, but we know who made it. This is someone down in Baltimore. He was a drum maker. Look on the opposite side. He just attached a banjo to it. 
1845. I think it's so pretty. Look at that. What a gorgeous instrument. Look at the side. Here, this was Frank Prophet's band show. He was the source for the song Tom Dooley. That's what got this whole folk revival going. He made this band show. He sang that song on this band show. This is later, you know, he played it for a fellow named Frank Warner out in, uh, from New York who collected from him. And then uh, he passed on to the Kingston Trio and they had a hit with it. It was sung on this band show. Then this banjo here, if you look in Pete Seeger's book, How to Play the Five String Banjo, there's a picture of Frank Prophet holding this banjo. I just think that's remarkable. It's belonged to a wagoner, probably a possum skin right here. Possum or a calf skin head right here. I've got one banjo that Frank Prophet made home. You can see the hairs on the inside. Look at this. This is sort of like a banjo. It's not really a banjo because it doesn't have a drum head, but it sure looks like one. Look at that face. There's a banjo player for you. That's what this is about. It's about these people. You want to know if a banjo is American? This is a fellow who was made by a fellow who was in World War I, served probably under General Pershing there, an American Expeditionary Force. He made this out of a German artillery shell. This thing weighs a whole lot. These are bullets, machine, like machine gun bullets. He tunes it by putting a nail in there. That's how he tunes it. This is, a, this is part of a rifle stock, this neck. This is sort of Yankee ingenuity, I'd say, if there ever was anything. Look at this. This is skillet. true song, you know, and maybe that partly comes from the songs where some of the songs, what they're called the broadside ballads, were kind of like newspaper reports at the time. But I think it's more than that. Talk about when I say a true song, um, talk about saying from the depths of one's honesty and uh, someone's life. Put a song together. It kind of fits a lot of hillbilly people traveling around the country today, and uh, their money's low, and they've got a long ways to go, and just everything's kind of a bother to them there. I got a little bit of put together. I want to kind of hit a little bit over here for you. Uh, I think I'm going to call it the uh, traveling bluegrass picker. <laughs> I think that about apply to all of them. Uh, maybe not nowadays, a lot. Back in my days, it would. You can always hear it and the sound of it and the singing of it, that kind of truth to experience. Virginia Mountains keep on calling me. They call it almost hell. 
of where I sit here right now in this chair is where I was brought up as a young fellow. And um, many times I've seen my mother play for Saturday night parties here in this hollow we're in now. And for my Uncle Jam or some of the neighbors, you know, would have a Saturday night party. And all I would do is just stand right at my mother's feet all night long and watch her play the banjo. And that was in inspiring to me pretty much there. It starts for me with listening to Flat and Scruggs and hearing them on TV and loving that and old records at home and how much excitement my father felt when he heard it and uh, he always liked that finger pick style and that careful mathematical elaboration that goes on with the banjo and I, it's hard not to love that i ran into a one-armed banjo man who came in here to play a show one time and he, he was with a man named Johnny Wright and his Tennessee Hillbillies. And they played a big bottom just about two miles from here. And I went to see that. And he had a banjo, and his, his left arm was missing right at the joint. His name was Emory Martin, and he's still living today. He would lay a banjo down across his lap and note it with the stub of his arm and pick it with two fingers on his right hand. And that was a great inspiration to me to... Get, uh, to hear a sound of a banjo with no amplification whatsoever. And the banjo had a real roaring tone to it that I wanted to really get my hands on that banjo. <laughs> <laughs> This structure right here we're looking at is a coal cleaning plant. There used to be just a regular coal tipple there where we had to pick the rock from the coal before we could sell it. And that's a place where I used to work right there, but as you can see right now, they're tearing it all down. That's, it's being disassembled and hauled away. Everybody who went to school in this area here was always uh, uh, uptight, you know, and ready to graduate real quick uh, just to go to work. But uh, they wanted to have a little money in their pocket to jingle jangle and an old uh, fast car to run up and down these curves with around here. That's what we had to look forward to when we got of age, to work here. This coming September, the 17th, will be the big uh, hot lick day that I went to Duke University for a headache that I'd been having for a year and a half. And through all the MRIs and brain scans and this I had took, nobody could find anything, but Duke found it. They found a tumor on the brain, which was malignant, they told me. And so I had the operation on uh, the 17th of September of last year and I, this January and February, I stayed a month and a half at Duke. 
and I was taking uh, radiation treatments, both sides of the head in the center. And uh, as far as I know, I'm just about through with it. I feel great. I, I never have any symptoms, but I have a sort of paralytic part in the left-hand side of my face right now here. But I and I think when Don Stover, he had that wonderful song he wrote some years ago, Things in Life. He was talking about, well, more than just stuff he knew, but experiences he, he deeply felt, and he gave it a great artistic form to do it. That's a wonderful, wonderful creation. Even the doctors that are doctor me at Duke University, they look at me when I come in there joyful and, and acting silly. I've always been a silly hillbilly, you know, on stage or off stage, and they stare a hole right through me. They can't figure out why I'm feeling so good. And makes me think, too, they might know something that I don't know, but I, I think if you got something wrong with you, you're gonna feel it. You'll feel that there is something wrong dragging you down, or maybe pain, which I don't have any pain. If I had to entirely quit, I think my symptoms might get a little worse. <laughs> but I really, uh, I really appreciate the old banjo. If you get a little lonely, you like I've said many times, you can pick it up and start picking. You can forget. That's that's good therapy. Now when the overcast get down in some lonesome gray. I've never had a bad attitude. I've never been scared or I've never been afraid. I've never had. What is true is true. Everybody's gotta die someday. We've gotta die of something. You've heard that many, many times. And this head thing I have here, it might be my something that I have to die with. So if the last verse says, when they lower my casket down and some lonesome grave to rest, and you take your last look at my face, you could say I did my best. So uh, that's the way I want to go out, you might say, you know. I want to go out as people saying, he's a fine guy, he did good, and I always say the good outweighs the bad. What is the banjo figuratively, metaphorically? Well, I was thinking in terms of individual practitioners, you know, about the different players. And that's the part that's the most meaningful. So it's played by people in the mountains, it's played by, well, it turned on whole generations of people in the city, you know, it's, uh, it's a meeting of people. Uh, Musicians, musicians can't help but play together or, or listen to each other, and uh, that goes on not only with banjo, but all over the place. And it gets very complicated and wonderful because of that, which I've always loved. Thank you. 